Hey guys, we are so glad that you joined us today. Throughout the next few months, our pastors are speaking on legacy, and we encourage you to stay connected to our midweek and weekend services. We are so glad that you are part of our church family, and we hope that you enjoy today's message. I'm excited about this, man. This is going to be a crazy week. We are on what is the crest of a crazy, crazy, amazing week, because conference is here, right? It's here. So conference launches, our Legacy Conference launches this Thursday night. If you are not registered for conference, register. All of the night sessions are free. So when you register, what you're registering for, registering for are the day sessions and the exclusive um, Legacy t-shirt. Um, VIP seating, and there's a whole bunch that comes with the registration. So look online, overcomercc.org. Go ahead and, uh, and register for the conference. Um, if you aren't able to, to make the day sessions or, or financially it's difficult to be able to register, all of the night sessions are free, and we are having some amazing, amazing speakers that are going to be in the house. Um, Dr. Mike Hayes, um, and Kathy Hayes from Covenant Church in Carrollton, Texas, are going to be here. And if you have never heard Dr. Hayes speak um, or ever felt the love of Pastor Kathy Hayes, you, you need to be here um, to, to encounter them. Um, obviously, Pastors G and D. I mean, we got so many speakers coming in from out of town. So it's going to be an awesome, awesome time in church. So you're just definitely going to make sure you, you're here. Um, Pastors Joe and Jean Parker, part of the reason that we're, it's called Legacy is they started this church 40 years ago. 40 years ago in ministry, my wife and I have been pastoring for almost four years. And, and that they've been, they planted the church times 10 of that. And, and they are some amazing people. Um, and they're going to be here and speaking and sharing their story with us. I remember I met Pastor Joe like a year, like a, not, yeah, like a year and a half ago. And if, if you don't know the, the campus here, we have our offices up behind the sanctuary. And I was coming out of the offices, and he was walking into the offices. And I knew who he was. Like, he's a legend. It's Pastor Joe Parker. So he's coming out. I'm coming out, and he's coming in. And he's like, hey, man, how you doing? I'm like, I'm good, man. How, how are you? He's like, I'm good. He's like, what do you do here? And I said, I said, me and my wife are the youth and young adults pastors here. And he's like, oh, man, because his, his um, son-in-law is Andre Sawyer. Kristen is Pastor Joe and Jean's daughter. So he's like, oh, I heard about you. My, son, or my son-in-law told me about you. So I'm like, oh, man, it's, it's an honor to meet you. Um, he's like, let me give you some advice. It's like right out the gate. So I'm thinking, like, did I fail the test? Did what, like, what did Andre actually say about, about me? <laughs> so he's like, no, nah, man, I just want to give you some advice. He's like, three things, three things. I want to give you three things. The first thing is love Jesus. Love Jesus. Second thing is preach the gospel. And the third thing is, is don't get weird. <laughs> Don't get weird. Like, <laughs> he starts talking about, there was a, there was a church around that, that had gone through some ups and some downs, and he's like, you don't want to get weird, because once you get weird, you get away from the gospel, and you have to love Jesus, and you have to preach the gospel. I mean, that's the call. That's what Jesus gave his disciples in Matthew 28. Go and preach the gospel. Go and make disciples, teaching them everything that I have told you and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, he, what, so what he's given me out of his years, out of his decades of ministry is simple. And sometimes we kind of convolute life by trying to make it so complex in this Christian walk, by trying to make it so complex, and we argue over theology, and we, there's division, and there's all this crazy stuff that goes on. And at the end of the day, after his decades of service and decades of service to the Lord, that was just 40 years launching this church. He followed Jesus for years before that. So out of all of his experience, the, the, the top three things he could tell me is love Jesus, Preach the gospel and don't get weird. That's some deep wisdom right there. <laughs> so you want to definitely be here in the house to meet pastors Joe and Jean. And, and there, is a, there is a depth of wisdom that comes from those two. For them to, to continue to serve the Lord even now, you want to be in this place. It's going to be a crazy environment. It's going to be an amazing, amazing environment. 
where we look at the past and what God has done, and we look at what he's doing, and we look at what the plan is for him to do in the future. So you, you want to be a part of legacy. It's then, it's now, it's forever. So you definitely want to, uh, definitely want to connect to that. Um, and, and, and I was thinking about all this this week. And, um, and being in youth ministry is kind of hard, right? Summer is pretty easy. It's pretty, co- not easy, but it's pretty consistent. Like you got kids coming. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a month where attendance kind of waver, kind of wavers a little bit because people start going on vacation and all that. But for the most part, it's pretty consistent. So you start feeling real good. Numbers are good. It's good energy. It's awesome. And then school comes. And school is crazy, especially when you have students who are in like AP classes and they end up having a whole bunch of homework and can't make service. So, so, so this is just to kind of tell on myself a little bit. I was um, Wednesday night, um, I'm upstairs, I'm about to preach. And I look out and there's like maybe 30 kids. And you'll have nights where you'll have like 50 kids. You'll do an event, there'll be like 65 kids. You'll have camp, like 75 kids. You'll have a night where there's like 20. And I'm like, gosh, man, what is going on, Lord? So I preach the message. Um, and, uh, and people are, you know, they're like, hey, man, you know, you feel, you know, you feel good. Like as a communicator, when people are connecting to what you're saying, it feels good. Like, okay, I'm in the vein. I'm not up here just mumbling. I'm actually saying something that the Spirit of God has has prompted me to say, and I'm communicating it effectively enough to where people can understand what he's telling me, right? Because a lot of times, has it ever happened to you where the Holy Spirit gives a word to you and you give it to somebody, you're like, okay, that didn't really make sense. But you know what I'm saying? Like you try to communicate what the Holy Spirit has told you, and it doesn't come out quite how you received it, like as clear. So so communicating, you want to make sure that you can communicate so you... When people can connect to what you're saying, you know, okay, okay, I'm doing this effectively enough. Thank you, Jesus. But I get home, and, I'm, and yesterday, um, I'm in my garage, and uh, I got a weight set out there, so I'm working out, and the Lord, and I listen, to, I typically listen to scripture when I work out, and then if something speaks to me, then I'll pause it, and then uh, kind of think on that for a while. And the scripture that, that popped out was this one. Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 and 23 says this, Your eye is the lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness actually is. So the Lord asked me this question after I paused it after this scripture. He said, what are you focused on? What are you focused on? And he knows my thoughts. So he knows I'm rolling all these variables around in my head as far as ministry, as far as attendance, my kids. Are they going deep? Am I, am, I val- am I loving and cherishing the ones that he's given me on any given night? Or am I in a place where I would rather have other kids? So he's like, he's like, and I'm telling on myself, and he's like surveying me. He's asking me these questions. And, and, this, and this, this scripture comes out, and then I pause it, and he's asking me, what, is your, what are you focused on? What is your filter? What are you thinking about? So that's kind of what we're going to talk about tonight. Let's pray. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity, for your word. Your scripture, your leading, your guiding. I thank you for your words and not mine. Speak to all of us tonight. Change our lives. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Uh, I I remember when Noah, I have five kids. I have a 16-year-old son, a son who's about to be 12, and then I have a 9-year-old and a son who's about to be 8, and then a 3-year-old daughter. And when my son, who is about to be eight, Noah, when he was about to go into kindergarten, you know, anyone who has kids, you got to take them and get their eyes checked, and you got to get shots, and you got to get all this stuff done in order for them to enter into the school system. So I take him there, um, and he's taking his eye exam. 
So he's knocking this thing out the park, and I'm proud of him. You know, like as parents, you like you want to make sure your kids are like, like, does he know what the letter A looks like? We'll see. Like, so, so he's taking the test, and he's standing back, and he's nailing these letters. Bam, bam. I'm like, that's my boy. Look at him. And then it gets to the plus sign, because you don't have like a minus sign, plus sign. And then she's like, what is this? He's like, a minus Um, There's a zero. He's like a zero. Gets to the plus. She's like, what is this? He's like a cross. And you know what I'm saying? And she said this. She said, what is this? Cross. What is this one I'm pointing at? It's a cross. And then it connected to her. That's a cross to him. If I would have taken that test, I would have said a plus sign. That's what I would have said. But in his mind, in his perspective, that was a cross. So when the Lord asked me, what are you focused on? What what are you focused on? It has to be the cross. It has to be. It can't be a substitute. It can't be anything else. It has to be the cross. It has to be what God has given us through the cross, the the authority that he has given us to walk in and the power that he's given us and the peace that he's given us. That has to be our focus because anything else is an imposter. Anything else is competing for the place of the cross. So it's always, it's the cross. It's always the presence of God in our lives. It's always what he has given us. Man, we're talking about legacy Legacy. Like when when I'm not here, what will be? What will be? Like when I'm gone, what will be here? I want I want to to be able to see through the same filter that God has. I don't want to see through a human filter. And I know that that's going to be the battle, right? Because we're hybrids. We're, we're, we're human and we're spirit. So that's always going to be the battle. But I don't want my default to be my human filter. I want my default to be the filter of Christ, to be God's filter. So when I see situations and I see scenarios, I don't see them in my humanity. But I see them according to the spirit that's alive in me through the authority that God has given me. So my scenario is not this mountain, right? But it's actually what it really is. It's actually what it really is. So scenarios can be built up in our minds to be these crazy, crazy, uh, uh, unbeatable obstacles. But they're not. I mean, what is the worst you know what I'm saying? Like, man, you, we were talking in the green room about the Apostle Paul. Like, this dude was, like, shipwrecked three times. Naked, bleeding, beaten. Shipwrecked three times. How many times do we read about his shipwreck? One. That means there's two other occurrences that we don't even know about. But that's his life, though. Like, he's, he's, like, all in. And that's what he's encouraging the Corinthians. Like, man, you, you, got, you got to make some decisions. You have to move in the direction that, that truth is in. Like, what's, what, what is really staring us in the face? And that's what we're going to look at. What is our filter? I want my, my, ele- my vision to be elevated so that I can see what God sees. Because if, 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 if my perception is bad, right, if the way that I see the world is bad, if it's always negative, if the world is always against me, if people are always against me, then I'll never trust anybody. Then everything I think about people will become what I say about people. And then what I, if the way that I say about people is always negative, the way that I act towards people is also going to be negative. 
So then it'll create habits of these negative actions towards people or specific types of people. And then that will shape my destiny. That will shape the way that I see humanity. That'll shape the way that I interact with people. That'll shape everything. So Jesus is like, man, if the filter ain't right and you think it's right, because sometimes you can get with people who justify treating people bad, who justify being, you know what I'm saying, mean to people. And, and like you get around people who can justify this ungodly behavior, then Jesus says, how great is that darkness? If that person honestly thinks the way that they're living is good, then how dark is that really? But what's crazy is he is the light of the world. He is the light of the world. And it says that the darkness cannot overcome his light. That's the light that we need, the perspective that we need. And, and there are situations, I'm not saying, man, once you're like, oh, I'm in that, that situations ain't going to try to rock you because the devil has always tried to dethrone Christ from the very beginning. From the very beginning, the devil has always tried to exalt himself over the throne of God. So if you think that he's not going to do it anymore, well, surprise, surprise. Watch what happens in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 8. It says this. It says, when the king of Aram, or Aram, was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officials and say, we will mobilize our forces at such and such a place. But immediately, Elisha, the man of God, I love how here when they, when they introduce Elisha, they, they also say the man of God. So they don't just give you his name, they also give you his lifestyle. I just pray, man, when people talk about me, that that's the lifestyle that they attribute to me. Not like Pastor Franklin, that word, that no good, dirty dog, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't want anyone, when my name pops up in their mind, to be like, nah, he's a liar, he's fake. I don't want any of that. So when Elisha's name pops up in the scripture to be there forevermore, the man of God is what they say about him. And if you know the story about Elisha, what's what's crazy about this guy's life is he wanted what God had for him. And and he wanted it so bad that when his his, uh, mentor, Elijah, when he went up, he wanted to make sure he was with him so he could get a double portion of the anointing that Elijah had. And this is what's amazing about anointings. God is not just just, uh, randomly throwing anointings out. You have to know that the anointing that you carry is the anointing that is necessary for this hour. So Elisha didn't just receive a double portion because simply that was his desire. He received a double portion because that time period required the double portion that was in him. So this time period requires the anointing that is in you. Whatever God has put in you, we need at this hour. The kingdom needs at this hour. So we can't sit back as spectators. You have to understand the kingdom has never been a spectator sport. God has never looked for people to sit the sidelines. Never. He was never like, man, show me somebody who can ride a bench. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody who don't want to get in the game. He's like, I need somebody who's going to do something. So this has never been a spectator sport. Never. There is no competitive sport where the champions are spectators. Never. The champions always engage. So there's no confusion. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, there, there's no, co- Jesus, like, if, if this was a spectator sport, Jesus would have never come and served. He would have came and sat. That's why he said, I didn't come here to be served. I'm not a spectator, but I came here to serve. And Elisha is getting in the game because, and this is why it's so powerful, like this time period needs your anointing, needs your anointing. Whatever God has marked you with, we need. The kingdom needs now not to be like, well, you know what, I just want to, let me just sit back and pray about this. You know, like on SpongeBob's, six years later. (laughs) Ain't moved. 
I ain't moved. I'm just saying, like, what, what you carry, we need. We need. And Elisha understood that. So he's like, I'm not leaving. Because what I want is a double portion of that. So he got it. And he's in a situation now where Elijah is gone. And they got a situation where this, this king is trying to make war against the Israelites. And what it says is, it says, but immediately, verse 9, but immediately Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, don't go near that place for the Arameans, Arameans, there we go, are planning to mobilize their troops there. And it says this, so the king of Israel would send word to that place indicated by the man of God, time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he would be on alert there. And then the king of Aram became very upset over this, and watch what he does. It says, he called his officials together and demanded, some of y'all, somebody in this room is a traitor. Somebody in here is a traitor. Because how in the world does this dude know every time I'm going to make a move? How does he know that? What is going on? Somebody in this room is a rat, and I need to find out who it is. Who has been informing the king of Israel of my plans? And this is what it says in verse 12. It's not us, my lord, the king, one of the officials replied. Elisha, the prophet in Israel, tells the king of Israel even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. When you are in your room alone, God hears. God hears. So the anointing that Elisha carries is the one that is going to free Israel or the one that's going to keep Israel safe at this hour. Because the anointing that he had is the anointing that they needed. The anointing that you have is the anointing that we need. So he's like, somebody up in here, this dude got this room tapped, there's a camera up in here somewhere, big brother is watching, I don't know what is going on in this room. And they're like, look man, this is beyond us. It goes so deep that the things you say alone, this dude knows. In other words, you can't keep nothing from this dude. And this king is smart. Watch what he does. Verse 13 says this. Go and find out where he is, the king commanded, so that I can send troops to seize him. And the report came back. Elisha is in Dothan. Look, look what happened. This dude is like, okay, look. I can't get this army, but I'm going to get this dude. Because if I can take this guy out, then I can take all these other. See what happens if, if, if the enemy can bench you. If he can keep you on the sidelines for whatever reason, bad decisions in your past, bad decisions you make now, what, whatever the reason is that can keep us out of the game. And we're talking about legacy. So everything I'm telling you is within the backdrop of legacy. See, if the, if the, if the enemy kept me on the sidelines, then my 16-year-old son wouldn't be helping us lead worship in youth ministry. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's, there's, if, if because of my, I went through a divorce, like, I made a lot of bad decisions in my life. If I allowed those decisions to keep me on the bench, then what would I hand down to my kids? I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be taking the eye test. No, I wouldn't be at the eye test talking about cross. Cross. He wouldn't do that. Why? Legacy. Legacy. But we got to get the right filter. Sometimes we filter life through our past pain. Or we filter our future through our past decisions. Jesus said if the tree is bad, make the tree good. If the tree's bad, make the tree good. Right? There's, a, there's a, a parable he told where the man dug around, dug around the tree. So the, so the guy who owns a vineyard comes up to this tree. He's like, this tree's not bearing any fruit. Cut this thing down and throw it away, which a lot of times is how we treat ourselves. I'm not bearing no fruit or I'm not producing what I think I should produce, so just throw me away. 
I'm done. I'm out. Forget this. I can't live this. I can't turn this. I can't make this happen. Just get rid of me. In the parable, the, the guy who, who tends the tree, right, the guy who is connected to the tree, the guy who actually cares for the tree and cares for the produce, the, the guy who owns it is like, man, get rid of that. I'll just get another one. The dude's like, no, 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 no. Let me do something with this one. Let me dig around the bottom of this tree and let me put fertilizer on here. Let me, let me tend to whatever it is that's keeping this tree from bearing some fruit. Let me deal with that, and then when you come back, if it ain't bearing no fruit, then we'll deal with it then. See, that's what he does with us. But we have to let him dig. And sometimes digging is not fun. Because when you dig, you actually get to the root. And when you get to the root, that's when you get to where the disease actually is. See, if you see it in the leaves... That's not where the source is. So you can't keep pulling off dead leaves. Let's get these bad leaves out the way. You got to get to the root. So that means the way that we see has to be the way that he sees. That's why Jesus would say, man, the, the eye is a lamp to the body. The way that you see life affects every single part of you. So if it's bad and you think it's good, then it's really bad. It's really bad. So this is what happens. So the king, uh, verse 14, it says, So one night the king of Aram sent a great army with chariots and horses to surround a city to get one dude. These guys is after one guy. But you know why he's doing that? If this dude knows what I'm going to do before I do it, then I'm not going to show up unprepared for what this guy might know I'm about to do. What this guy thinks. I'm a, I, I already know that this guy hears from God. So if he knows I'm going to go over there, then he probably knows I'm going to come here. So we need to get everybody. Get these dudes out of bed. Get the horses up. Get the, get the chariots ready. We're going. Get everybody up. We're going because we're about to go get this dude. That's what it says. And surrounded the city. Oh, to surround the city. Verse 15 says, when the servant, watch this. When the servant, focus on him. When the servant of the man of God got up early in the morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. My man woke up like, Oh, we'll go out for this morning walk. Ba da 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 da. <laughs> so he got up like it was just Thursday, like no big deal, like just putting the dumpsters out. Like it was like it was like trash day, like no big deal. I was going to get these garbage cans out, and then he comes outside and he's like, they got straps. Uh, <laughs> like comes out, they got chariots, they got horses, they got soldiers, they got everything. And look what happens. He says, oh, sir, what will we do now? The young man cried to Elisha. Where's his filter? This dude has been with Elisha, right? It's his servant. So wherever is Elisha went, he went. That dude went to the bathroom. That dude standing outside the door like, not this one, homeboy. You can just keep moving. Keep moving. This one's occupied. Like, that's this guy. Everywhere he goes, everywhere Elisha goes, this guy goes. Everywhere. So if you read this chapter, like 10 verses earlier, this dude made an axe head float. Elisha made an axe head float. If, if you, axe heads don't float, just in case you don't know. Like, they're heavy pieces of metal. They don't float. But he made it float. Elisha made it float. So this guy, because of his filter, his human filter, forgets what he just did and comes into the scenario that looks impossible and fear hits him. Fear hits him. If you want to leave a legacy, we have to battle fear. Because we don't have a spirit of fear that lives in us. 
power of love and a sound mind, which means that spirit of fear will try to come in and invade territory. And you have to understand kingdom principle is this. The enemy operates based on jurisdiction. So the devil doesn't just have access to your whole life. He has to be given authority to your whole life. So he can only operate within the realms of authority he's been given. The same thing you look at Job. The only reason this dude still loves you is because you blessed him. Well, take all his blessings away. You, you think the devil didn't think about that before? He thought about taking every blessing Job had before, but he couldn't touch Job. Why? Because he didn't have jurisdiction. Sometimes we give the enemy way too much jurisdiction in our life. Sometimes when fear comes, we give the enemy that jurisdiction. And if you think the devil sleeps in or takes a day off, you are sadly mistaken. Because the devil don't call out. Ain't going to make it in today, y'all. Ain't feeling that well. That's not the devil. He don't, he, he's not like the alarm. The, he, don't, he don't sleep. So he's not like sleeping. He's not going to start getting at you until noon. Like that's not how, that's not how he works. As soon as you wake up, he's already got some things ready for you. So that's what happens. So that's what happened to Elisha's servant. His servant comes. And he's like, dude, I I don't know what we're going to do. There's people everywhere, man. There's horses, man. You know I'm scared of horses. I can't stand horses. They big, you know what I'm saying? They fast and strong. Soldiers, I don't know what to do. What are we going to do? That's what he comes in and says. And look at Elisha's response to him. It says, I can read it like this, don't be afraid. But that's not how he said it. You see the exclamation point? That means this dude is like, you, you need to get some things together. That's not like, don't be afraid. Come on, come here, sit down. Come on. Right here. He's like, don't be afraid. What are you afraid of? And look what he says to him. Elisha told him, he says, but there are more on our side than on theirs. And then the next part is my prayer for us as we come to conference. You have to understand something about about conference. Somebody come hold this water up to me while I drink it and I'm playing (laughs) this is what you have to understand about conference sometimes we come to conference looking to be entertained instead of looking for an opportunity to enter in like we want lights and cameras and speakers and we want t-shirts and and merch and we want like in all I'm not saying that stuff is bad because this needs to be an event we need to pull out all the stops this needs to be like the best thing if you go to a concert and they got merch you better come to church and we got merch There ain't nothing wrong with merch. Ain't nothing wrong with T-shirts and lights and cameras. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Just because we got cameras on me, we don't have Jesus. But if we come here with an expectation of entertainment, then we missed it. Because this is about legacy. And my legacy is not to be entertained, but it's to enter in. So what we have to do is we have to get to the place that Elijah is in for his servant. And watch what he says about his servant. It says, verse 17, then Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. You think the enemy has chariots? We got chariots that don't burn. Do you know what I'm saying? Like there ain't a whole lot you can bring against these chariots. These ones are already on fire. So don't worry about it. You know what I'm saying? Tell the archers with the flaming arrows they can just go home because these ones don't burn. You know what I'm saying? They on fire, but they're not consumed. That sound familiar? That's how you know he's in the picture. Because when it burns and it don't burn up, that's when you know God's hand is moving. So this dude goes outside. And sees what he didn't see before. Why? Because his lamp was changed. 
because the way that he saw his scenario was different. Why? Because there was a man of God who made intercession for him, prayed for him, who loved him enough to pull him into what God was doing. He could have said, man, go home. If you're going to be scared and you're going to be worried, just go home and lay down. You look like your stomach hurts. You know what I'm saying? You look like you got the bubble guts. You up in here all nervous now. Now go lay down somewhere, get yourself a glass of water and a nice warm blanket, and just stay home. Don't, he could have did that, but he didn't do that. Why? Because he loves him. And Elisha is not thinking about today. He's thinking about tomorrow. Because what he just built into this man is legacy. He showed him the same things that Elijah showed him. He's like, open this young man's eyes. Why? Because his lamp ain't that bright. Because this scenario is darkening the lamp to his body. So we need to change that. We need to transform that. And the only way for that to be transformed is for us to see God's hand. And that's why we have to always be looking for God's hand. If we are constantly trying to feel good, then we're going to mess around and miss it. That's why we can't come to conference trying to be entertained. We got to come and enter in. We got to enter into this. We, this is legacy, and we are celebrating some amazing things, and God is going to highlight what he has done, highlight what he is doing, and highlight what he's going to do, and everybody in this room is part of that. So you, you, we're not walking into this next week thinking we're going to see what's happening at OCC. Nope. We are going to see what God is doing in our lives as we are OCC. So everyone that's going to come and speak and and edify and encourage and bring wisdom is not just bringing wisdom so that they can sound real good standing in front of some people, but it's to ignite a legacy in our lives where we don't settle anymore, period. It's over. That's over because I'm not an entertainer. I'm not trying to be entertained. I'm trying to enter in. I'm not trying to look at this world like, oh, well, let's see what, let's see, like, if, if you're looking to be entertained, then you're looking to feel good. I just want to feel good. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to build legacy into my, my future so that my kids, when I'm not here, they still are. So people connected to my life knows when, they, when my name comes up, when my name comes up, I want them to talk about me the way they talk about this dude. Like, this, this guy's a man of God right here. I'll show you who you need to get there. So this dude prays and says, open his eyes, and he looked out and saw the chariots of fire. And then I'll end with this. It says, as the, the, army, the Aramean army advanced towards him, Elisha prayed, oh, Lord, change their filter. Make them blind. So the Lord struck them with blindness. So what his servant had, he took from him and gave to that whole other army so that they can't see the plans of God. But you can. See, the devil doesn't know your future. He don't know everything. God is all-knowing. Satan is not. He's not all-knowing. God's all-knowing. Now, the devil knows how to get you because he's been getting you like that for a while. So it's not like this big surprise to him. He's like, oh, no, I put this on this this screen in front of this dude. He's going to follow watch because he did it yesterday. He watched this yesterday. She did this yesterday. He acted like this yesterday. So what does he do? He keeps throwing the same thing at you. Because he knows how you acted yesterday, but he don't know how you're going to act tomorrow. He doesn't know if you're going to walk in the power of the Spirit of God today, and then tomorrow you make a different decision. 
I was tripping yesterday, but I'm not tripping today. I'm good. You know why? Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. So my filter is different today than it was yesterday. Why? Because I have the light in me. And the darkness cannot overcome this light. See, God knows everything. So when you think he's like, I'm done with this girl or this guy because of today. You think God is focused on this moment? When he sees you, he sees all of you. So the people that say no to Jesus today, we can't say, heathen. Only thing you want to do is smoke weed and drink. That's all you're trying to do. We can't, we can't, we got to keep praying for people. Why? Because he knows their tomorrows. So I can't make a decision about their tomorrows because of today. I have to pray that their eyes be opened so that the scenario doesn't overtake them. But Lord, let them see what I can see. Or let them see what you can see. So that their filter is changed. So that they know the legacy that they can leave is not the legacy that they're operating in today. Let them see how your power can overcome the enemy. If I could have the worship team go ahead and and come up. Um, So my encouragement tonight. Uh, is that he changes our filter. He changes. Pastor Gordon talked a couple weeks ago about perspective. And you see the perspective of this young man when he came out to ten, and he saw the army. And he's like, man, there ain't no way this is going to work out. And then Elisha looks up from his cornflakes <laughs> and says, What the heck are you so afraid of? What you afraid of? Do you know who's with us? Do you know that there's so many more with us? I don't care who the enemy brings. There is still more with us. It don't matter. It doesn't matter how many the enemy brings against you. There is more that is with you than more that is against you. So what we have to do as his people is we have to know. Okay. I mean, he got me yesterday. And I was focused on the wrong things. Because I need to see what he sees. If I'm going to build a legacy, I have to see what he sees. That's why God called David a man after his own heart. Because David hated what God hated And he loved what God loved. So I want to see what God sees. I want to know what God knows about me, about you. About my wife, about my kids. I want to see what he sees. Because I'm tired of what I see. How many of y'all in this room just tired of what you see? And you just need him to just, just change that. He can. He can. What did Jesus say? The power of God is upon me to give what to the blind? Sight. To heal the brokenhearted, set the captives free, and declare a new day. That ain't left. It's still there for us. So I want his vision for my future. I want the legacy that he has called me to leave. To leave. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, for your goodness and your faithfulness. I thank you, Lord, that you have brought us to this place. This place of of recognition. 
of reconciliation, this place of, of recommitment. And we just come near to you. And we fully expect you to come near to us because you promised that. Change our vision. Change the way that we see this world. Change the way that we see our future. Change the way that we see our past. Help us to see you in our yesterdays, just like we see you in our todays. And let us have exceeding faith to know that you are in our tomorrows. As we move into the season of celebrating 40 years of ministry and 10 years of having the banks with us up here and, and all the leaders that have come from that, and or let, us, let us take our legacy seriously. And pray that in 40 years, they'll be talking about us and telling our stories. Our stories of devotion to you. Of loving you and hating the enemy. Loving your ways and hating his ways. Let us just draw near to you in this season. And not just seek to be entertained, but also to enter in so that we can be enveloped by your presence because that's where transformation is, that's where peace is, that's where healing is, that's where restoration is, that's where wholeness is. It's only in your presence. And we want that. So we thank you for this time of worship as we get to enter in and, and just lay it all down before you. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, everyone said Amen. We hope that you enjoyed today's message. If God is impacting your life through Overcomer, we encourage you to bless others by investing today. You can give by going to our website at overcomercc.org give or by downloading our app and selecting give as well. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more messages like this one.